Hello. Welcome to part two of the Scientific Revolution notes for Mr. Roten. In today's show we'll be talking about Galileo and Isaac Newton. Galileo, Galileo, Galileo. Wow, that was weird. Galileo was another great scientist. He continued the ideas of Copernicus. Here's a little bit about his background info. In 1564, his father was a professional lute player, but due to a lack of demand for top lutenists, was forced to trade in cloth. He ensured, however, that his son benefited from his full attention, and by the age of ten, the young Galileo excelled at the lute. Initially, Galileo wanted to become a monk, but his father, who couldn't afford for his son not to have an income, persuaded him to become a doctor instead. So, at the age of 17, Galileo began studying at Pisa University where he became obsessed with the study of Euclid and Archimedes. By now, he had grown into a large, flame-haired rabble-rouser, enjoying fine wine, good living, and poking fun at people. He loved... Galileo wanted to observe closely how the planets worked. There was no way to do it. He heard about a toy that let you see farther called a spyglass. He got one, and messed around with the lenses, and created a more powerful device known as a telescope. He used it to study the planets closely. He noticed for one thing, that Jupiter had its own moon, and that moon moved in a circle around Jupiter. That meant that the Earth wasn't special in its design, other planets could be central bodies as well. Always fascinated by new devices. Galileo heard that a craftsman from the Netherlands had found a new use for common eyeglass lenses. The first telescope to reach Venice was a toy, a novelty, built to amuse partygoers. Spectacles, compared to telescopes, are very low-tech, but they had been around for several hundred years. It was only when lenses became available in certain range of strengths that one could take the weakest convex lens and combine it with the strongest concave lens and get an appreciable magnifying effect. Galileo set out to turn the Dutchman's toy into a useful device. Hearing reports of a new invention from a lens maker in Holland, I determined to fashion a device for myself and was able to make considerable improvements in it. Galileo realized that spectacle makers could not give him the lenses that he needed in order to make this device more powerful. They just weren't good enough and they weren't uh, the right strength. And so in order to improve the instrument, he had to teach himself to grind lenses. And that is extremely difficult. And it, it certainly was in 1610. At first, Galileo was only interested in the optics of the telescope. With his improved lenses, he increased its power tenfold. But his lenses did more than magnify. By reshaping these pieces of glass, Galileo would eventually reshape our view of the world. With his telescope, Galileo first set out to make some money. The naval arsenal of Venice was the greatest in all of Europe. What if the arsenal had a way to spot enemy ships hours before they appeared in the harbor? Wouldn't this give the Navy a distinct advantage? Installing his new device at the top of St. Mark's Tower, Galileo arranged persuasive, real-life demonstrations. Numerous gentlemen and senators more than once climbed the stairs of the highest bell towers of Venice to observe vessels so far away at sea that two hours and more were required before they could be seen by naked eye without my spyglass. From within the Venetian Senate came a handsome order for Galileo to supply the arsenal with spyglasses. Galileo was given a generous lifetime salary for his service to the Republic. Part scientist and part self-promoter, for now, his future seemed bright. But soon, his telescope would launch a dispute which would threaten to destroy its creator. 
Galileo wrote a book in 1610 to document his findings from his telescope. He wasn't as afraid as Copernicus, because the church had been weakened, only slightly, during the Reformation. He also believed that the Pope would support his ideas. He was wrong. The church refused to admit that they were wrong. Galileo even invited them to use his telescope to see the moons of Jupiter for themselves. Many came to look but all said nope, we don't see it. They argued further and asked him if the earth is moving like you say it is, why can't we feel it? Mr. Smarty Pants. Galileo then changed his focus and started to design some experiments to help explain motion. The story goes that after a particularly impassioned argument with an Aristotelian lecturer, Galileo set out to demonstrate once and for all that objects fall to Earth at the same speed regardless of their weight. He mocked anyone who disagreed with him. In practice, that meant most of his lecturers. He decided to drop two different sized cannonballs from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. This would surely settle the matter once and for all. Clutching his irregular balls, he climbed to the top of the tower and tossed them off. They landed on the ground at virtually, but not precisely, the same moment, and the crowd was left divided. No one could agree whether Galileo's balls had dropped at the same time. Tell me when you get a good picture, Joe. 370 years later, David Scott tried the same experiment on the surface of the moon. By repeating the experiment in a vacuum, Scott confirmed what Galileo had argued. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Falling balls, swinging pendulums, what does it all mean? Galileo was overturning 2,000 years of scientific orthodoxy. And he was doing it not just by observing the natural world, but by carrying out experiments with the help of new scientific instruments, which he himself was developing.